Hi everyone, Kevin Benison here, back with video 4 out of the 5 video series on the Lifting Operations and Lifting Equipment Regulations, or LOLA, 1998. If you've missed any of the previous videos, video 1 being about appropriate supervision, video 2 being about strength and stability of equipment, and video 3, yesterday's video, being about thorough examination, go back and watch those, particularly if you'll find any of those topics helpful to you or your organisation. And today's video, I'm going to be discussing the hot and often controversial topic of lifting persons. Let's get into it then. So what does LOLA Regulation 5 require? Regulation 5, of course, covering the requirements for the lifting of persons. Well, it specifies that every employer shall ensure that lifting equipment used for lifting persons is such as to prevent a person be crushed, trapped, struck or falling from the carrier. Then the next clause is ensure that where the carrier is used for work activities, so far as is reasonably practicable, it prevents a person being crushed, trapped, struck or fallen from the carrier. So A and B are quite similar. C has suitable devices to prevent the carrier falling. And D is so as to ensure that any person trapped in a carrier is not exposed to danger and can be freed. So those are the legal requirements. Let's kind of break those down. Well, firstly, looking at the difference between the first two, the main difference is that the first one, such as to prevent a person being crushed, trapped, struck or fallen from the carrier, is purely when the carrier is just used for access and egress. And the classic example is just a lift, an elevator car. So when you go on a lift, then the doors close, there's sensors on the door, it keeps you fully enclosed and indeed you can't, providing everything is working correctly of course, you can't fall out of the lift that kind of thing. But then when you're starting to do work activities, which is more on clause B, when you're doing work activities from the carrier, you've now got limbs potentially protruding from the carrier to do whatever activities that you're doing. So then it's very difficult to actually eliminate those things of persons being crushed or limbs being trapped, things like that. So then you've got to think about the measures that you put in place to minimise the risk of that happening so far as is reasonably, reasonably practicable. So that's very applicable to using the likes of a crane with a personnel carrier or indeed even a MUP, a mobile elevated work platform, a cherry picker. You're doing work activities from both of those pieces of equipment frequently. The third bit, suitable devices to prevent the carrier falling. Well, you're just thinking about how do you prevent that carrier coming away, you know, free falling. If you think about in a lift, they do have a braking system in there that if the ropes were to snap, then it's going to seize and stop the uh, car, the, the, the elevator car falling. So how do you do that? On a crane, perhaps? Well, certainly when you think about the, the method of attachment. So I'll go into some more details uh, in a short while. And then the last one is all about, essentially, how you're going to get people out. So we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Firstly, the big question, and one that people often struggle to answer, is, is a crane designed for lifting people? Well, it's not primarily designed for it. A crane is material handling equipment. So that doesn't mean to say that you can't use it. It means that you have to put the necessary precautions in place to make it safe to use. There are modifications, if you like, that will need to be made. You also need to assess whether properly designed equipment can be used if it's practicable to use properly designed equipment such as a mute. So let's take a look at the differences then. If we think of a mute as being equipment that's designed, a mobile elevated work platform or an aerial work platform as you may call it, or a cherry picker as it's commonly known, and when you look at a crane, some of the key differences. Well, firstly, thinking about who is in control of the equipment. The person in the carrier of the MUP 
is generally directly in control of the equipment. They have immediate control. Whereas in a crane, usually you're relying upon signals going to the operator. So it's secondary control, if you like. Then thinking about the method of attachment. So the carrier on a MUP is directly fixed to the machine. You've got a pin going through, then usually a nut and bolt, and it takes uh, tools and skill. Tools and skill is the, the general phrase to attach and detach. Whereas on a crane, all you've got is a master link going in a sprung catch. Now, there are some solutions to overcome that, but even thinking about just taping the safety catch shut can be an additional small measure on the way to making it safer. Then thinking about other differences, well, you've got the pendulum effect on a crane as well. So it's perhaps more susceptible to wind or particularly thinking about, you know, <laughs> we all know a swingy crane operator who uh, they might think they're great, but the load's all over the place all the time. Can you imagine being suspended from, you know, the, the crane jib by a bit of wire when you've got a swingy crane operator? So you have the pendulum effect there. Uh, which is exposed to, as I say, wind and, of course, erratic operation in the crane. Yes, you do get a lot of movement on a mute as well, and some people would indeed say they would prefer to be up in a personnel carrier on a crane than up in a mute, uh, you know, because of the movement that you get on the mute. I'm quite comfortable in a carrier on a crane, providing the operator is pretty decent and the wind isn't too high. Then things get a little bit more hairy. So just thinking about that as well. Uh, another one as well is uh, the factor of safety. So the factor of safety is already designed into the capacities on things like a MUP because it's designed for lifting persons. When it comes to a crane, it's designed for lifting materials. So actually, it will generally be closer to its yield point when it hits the limits than, say, uh, equipment designed for persons would be. So... The equipment designed for lifting persons will be marked up as such as well. A crane is marked up for lifting goods, for lifting loads, not persons. So therefore, you need to consider that and build in a factor of safety. Now, this is stuff that we talk about in our training, of course, and go into more detail, detail on actually how to do that. But something that you need to consider at the moment anyway. Um, also thinking about uh, the rescue plan. So with a MUP, generally what you have is you have somebody up in the basket. And of course there are situations that makes this not possible, but let's just speak, speak about in most situations. If the MUP was to break down, then you can generally use a secondary system, which may be an auxiliary, auxiliary motor or indeed a hand-operated pump down at the bottom. And somebody can then use that to help get the boom down on the MUP. Whereas if you're in a crane and you're now suspended 50 metres up above the ground and the crane breaks down, now on, on my time in cranes, during my time on cranes, had it where we were doing a lifting operation and the hydraulic pump failed and it was going to be a couple of days before we could get a new hydraulic pump out. So we gauged the situation and we actually had some boom telescoped out. So we had to leave the boom telescoped out until we got that replacement pump. There was a way of getting it in, you know, but the fitter said it would have been meant breaking into the hydraulic system, which brought its own risks. So if you think about that sort of situation, which is the extreme, and bear this in mind, you know, when you do your risk assessment, think about the likelihood of these things, but there is the possibility. Crane breaks down, and now you've got uh, an electrical storm, or you've got extremely high winds come across, or you've got uh, sub-zero temperatures. These are all things that now a person trapped in the carrier, as it says in part D of the regulation, could now be exposed to danger and do you have any way of freeing them? There are suggestions within the lower guidance for rescue plans, but it's something commonly overlooked. If I'm doing an audit on site and there's lifting a persons going on, then you generally I'll ask the supervisor, if the crane breaks down, how are you getting them down? And then if they struggle to answer that, it doesn't necessarily mean that nothing's in place, but clearly they're not familiar with it. 
So um, just giving an example, and, and that's another point as well, appropriate supervision again, it comes back to. You may have the best plan in the world, but if it's not communicated effectively and you can rely upon a person making sure that's implemented, then it could be worthless. So appropriate supervision is extremely important in this case as well. So there was a time going back a number of years ago and I saw a post just the other day on social media about dinner in the sky. Now these kind of activities, of course the manufacturers will say that the cranes are not for those things. And I'm not kind of going to any particular side here. I'm just kind of going on my experiences and, you know, I, I don't talk about right and wrong. I don't feel that's helpful. I feel it's best to talk about what's best in a particular situation. So you can draw your own conclusions on what's right or wrong if you think that way. You know, that's just trying to get one side or the other. There's always looking at ways uh, of thinking, what's the best I can do in this situation? So... Let's take away from whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing. But essentially, the manufacturers will say that cranes are not really to be used for leisure activities, such as dinner in the sky or bungee jumping, these sort of things. Now, I've been involved with both. And my view is that when the necessary measures are taken, those can be perfectly safe activities. And I can understand why the manufacturers will put those disclaimers in because, of course, they don't want to be responsible and they understand the kit far better than we do. But when you're kind of using it in a way that sticks within the sort of parameters laid out for standard loads, if you like, then it can be safe. So with Dinner in the Sky, uh, I'm not going to go into the situation, the politics of it, but essentially I end up planning this. This was going back quite a number of years ago. And one of the key things I specified to get done, I mean, I completely started again with the lift plan and, and came up with all sorts of different procedures for, you know, checks prior to lift and the movement of the crane that was permitted, the height for reaching it with a secondary crane. Um, so all that was in place and also actually went through practicing getting people out of the table. For me, then I was comfortable. I knew in the very, very unlikely event that the crane was to break down and people were stuck, we could get them out. So that was cool. So that's just an example of that. Um, and of course, there's lots more to it than that. Lifting persons is a complex lift and there's a lot to consider. So give us a shout, you know, if you, you would like any help on that. We do cover it more thoroughly in our training and indeed during our consultation. But for now, thank you very for much for watching. If you have any comments, leave them below, of course. And do subscribe or follow to make sure you get following videos. And indeed, if they're helpful to others, please share them too. But for now, have a fantastic day and catch you again tomorrow. Bye for now.